start it, Mr. Begum. Begum. Yeah. A very good evening from Doha and welcome to all. How are you guys? Hope everyone is fine and good and healthy. People who don't know me, let me introduce myself. My name is Badr Sheikh. I'm holding a position of vice chair in SIPS Qatar branch. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all in the Chartered Institute of Procurement Supply, that SIPS, community event in collaboration with QDB, Qatar Development Bank. This is our third session. On behalf of Qatar branch, we'd like to thank you all for giving you the previous time to be here there as today. And we hope you enjoy this online session, which is fourth event of this year. I suppose this is the third event and uh, it covers the thought provoking topic, which is compliance with innovation and addressing supply chain challenges. And to enlighten us further on this topic, we have esteemed and sought after speaker, Mr. R. V. Srinivasrao, Chairperson Sips Qatar, who is presenting this topic. So I would like to say a few words on how two entities that made this even possible starting with SIPS. SIPS is Chartered Institute of Procurement Supply. It's a United Kingdom-based non-profit voluntary organization registered under UK Royal Charter. SIPS is the dynamic champion driving the global procurement and supply management profession across the world. With an objective of leading excellence in procurement and supply, it aims to promote good practice and provides services for the benefits of a procurement community with over 200,000 members all over the world. And we have our event sponsor, Qatar Development Bank. From Qatar Development, from the name itself, you can understand it's a Qatar-based bank, purely Qatar-based bank. It is Qatar Development Bank, as popularly known as QDB. It's a bank fully funded by the state of Qatar, and its headquarters is in Doha. The main objective of this bank is to develop, diversify economic and industrial investment in Qatar. The bank finances small and medium-sized enterprises provide expert solutions to products as well as advisory services to industries to implement their pro projects in addition to housing loans for citizens subject to the approval of the housing department. Um, and employees, uh, but uh, being a little bit fast, but uh, as we know the time, we have a limited time. The session will start uh, for 45 minutes followed by the question and answer session. So if almost there are, handsome number of uh, participants has. So let us start, not wasting time. Let me introduce to our uh, main speaker. Uh, and the main topic is main part of today's event is compliance versus innovation by Mr. R. V. Srinivasrao, he's F. Sips. And followed with the question answer session after uh, 45 minutes. And then it will be a co closing note done by myself. So without wasting a time, I will introduce about Mr. R. V. Sinivas Rao. R. V. Sinivas Rao, or popularly called as Rao, does not need much of an interaction to a SIPS Qatar event. He is a very popular in the supply chain circle, not only in Qatar, but also in several other countries. By the way, he has just conducted another one, Ministry of uh, Labor, one of uh, the event in the morning, and it's, it's, uh, he's always busy with many other schedules. He's a regular speaker at a various supply chain events worldwide and a strong advocate for professional standard procurement and supply management and an impressive track record, holder of consistent success and significant value addition to supply chain of value stream management, process optimization and automation, contract management, cost comparison and value enhancement and warehousing and change management. Mr. Rao is a double postgraduate with various supply chain qualification, including prestigious fellowship with SIPs, that is called FSIPs. But uh, I am also MCIF, that is MCIFs <laughs> and UK from the VK, with over 25 years of strategic and operational supply chain experience in manufacturing and aviation sector. He's also mentored several UAE and Qatar nationals. That is also an amazing part of Mr. Rao. He's also founder of member of SIPS Qatar branch and is now holding the position of branch chair and followed with myself. I am a vice chair uh, with him. Now, let us not waste much time. Thank you, Mr. Rao, for accepting to be distinguished speaker at one of our own events. Now we would like to hear him speak about the latest topic of compliance versus innovation, addressing challenges in SCM, that is supply chain management. Over to you, Mr. Rao. 
please. Good evening, Mr. Badar. Can you see me and hear me? Yes, absolutely, right, Mr. Rao. It's very clear. The sound Chris is clear. You clear. are clear. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, uh, that was a very long introduction. I don't deserve it. I'm a very small and humble person. But I think it, it was a little bit pulled along. But thank you for the lovely introduction. And of course, as we said, uh, thanks to Qatar Development Bank, you know, who is sponsoring these events. Of course, this could be the last one where we'll be having it as webinar. But our always the push has always been to conduct it on face-to-face -face basis. Of course, we missed that networking part into it. Now I can see so many people saying hello, Sanal. I have seen lovely, lovely people here. No, Mark Mazeli is here. Gopal, Nahid Said, Shubankar Ghosh, Fauzia Parveen, all the way from Pakistan is here. And you've got Ms. Tahani Al Nazi, Ishaq Maps, Tony Stephen. I, I think the list is not ending. You know, it's, it's just increasing. So it shows that people are missing this particular networking event. And, and we will continue to promote these events and cultivate the habit of knowledge sharing sessions. Uh, today's topic, compliance versus innovation. It, it's a very broad topic, actually. It applies in almost all of the areas. So what I have done is that, OK, Manal Abdullah, yes. Thanks for joining, Manal. Uh, it's nice. The topic is a very broad one. However, we'll narrow it down to the supply chain limit itself. And I, I will want to make it more interactive. I want to make it more interactive for all of you guys. So if you have any questions, you, you can definitely ask the questions. And we do have a Q&A box as well over there, which is being monitored by Mr. Badar. Mr. Badar is the, also, as he said, is the vice chair for the CIPS Qatar branch and uh, myself. Let, let me be very clear. I work for Qatar Airways. No, not linked with CIP. This is only a voluntary role for me. I'm paid by Qatar Airways. I'm sponsored by Qatar Airways to be in Qatar itself. But yes, we promote the best practices in procurement. And that is what our objective has been, knowledge sharing sessions. Now, the, let's start with today's topic. I'll start sharing my screen now. Uh, please let me know if you're able to see my screen. Yes, Mr. Rao, it's very, very clear, very clear. Go ahead, please. Okay, yeah, I've used some graphics. Normally this is more technological, but I'm trying to say that th there is a part of compliance coming into it. And, and we as innovators or the advocates of procurement, th there is certain responsibility on uh, each one of us saying that one, we need to be in the threshold of the compliance itself. And I don't know, I work in a very strict company and compliance is the key. Compliance to the safety, compliance to the quality and internally compliance to the process. So when we say that compliance to the process, what happens if, if you don't comply? And that too, in a sensitive department like procurement where you're dealing with millions of dollar transactions, certainly you don't want to attract the audit, isn't it? And typically when we say audits, Yes, procurement department is prone to audit, saying that you are spending the large amounts of money. They want to ensure that the certain rules, regulations of the, each organization are followed accordingly. So today's topic, compliance versus, uh, compliance versus innovation, will focus on challenges in, in supply chain management. Yeah. Uh, before we begin, I, I, I watched some uh, movies as well. One of the interesting movie. Uh, I don't know, this is a very interesting movie. I saw it and it really got me involved where it's got some um, diamond trade, illegal diamond trade, which happens and it speaks about uh, conflict diamonds and, uh, and all other areas. I don't know how many of you would have seen it, but it's an interesting movie where some people surrender it. But then again, the question comes across today. If you walk into any gold shop and you're trying to buy the diamonds, how do you make sure that this is not a conflict diamond? They'll certify saying that this is not a conflict diamond. But again, do we have a visibility or the transparency across the entire supply chain? No. Are they compliant? And if they are compliant, how do we know that it's compliant? Resourcing diamonds is, is a good news. But then 
diamonds to be sourced in a most compliant manner. And how is the innovation going to help? If you ask me, I would say that yes, diamonds are, we all know who is the best friend of the diamonds. So yes, I'm not gonna say it's bad to source diamonds, source the diamonds, but in an ethical manner. But how do you know the ethical manner is? When you add up into the technological innovation like the blockchain, and what does the blockchain do? Blockchain is basically a, a collection of records or a public ledger. It, it provides you a transparent and accurate end-to-end -end tracking in the supply chain. That is what we are talking about. Saying that any of the challenges you have in the compliance fields, it could be any, any reason. I'm not saying this. I used the example of conflict uh, diamonds. I recently saw the movie, so it just caught up in my eye and I said, okay, uh, it's fresh in my memory. And I said, yes, this is one field where it can be applied. And blockchain, we conducted one event as well, thanks to Mike and Vana. He explained very clearly saying that how the blockchain works and what is it. And in case, if the blockchain is 100% implemented in the trade of the diamonds and all, definitely it will become compliant. And then, you know, this is the innovations we are talking of. What are the innovations which are needed to make the entire process compliant? There are a lot more. In the next uh, 30 minutes, when I'll take you through some of those uh, discussions. I'll try to make it very interactive and with the live examples here. Innovation and compliance are key concept in supply chain management and procurement. Compliance, we know we can't run into it. However, when we say uh, innovation, are we going digital, are we manual? And in certain places, there is law of the land where you need the documents to be physically signed, stamped and all these things. Uh, I will just stop here for a second. I think I did not uh, go through the disclaimer. Please note, I think that's very important. That's also part of the compliance for my company. The disclaimer says this presentation is compiled by R.V. Srinivas Rao for CIPS Qatar branch virtual conference. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are his own and do not reflect the thoughts or opinions of the companies he has worked or is working. So this again is a compliance requirement saying that, you know, are you talking anything about the company? But no, I'm not talking. Whatever I'm speaking about is on the supply chain management itself. So th these sort of things, when we have it, this. Definitely, they, they go a long way. They, they go a long way in, in uh, SCM itself. Now, let's see. While innovation affects the supply chain management, both positively and adversely, I said adversely, remember that, and I'll tell you why I mentioned it. Compliance is responsible for reducing or eliminating SCM-related risks. So we are saying compliance will protect you, but at the same time, we said, uh, let's go further. Successful supply chain and procurement compliance and creative programs include enhanced visibility, that is what is needed, cooperation and control over the supply chain and procurement compliance execution. That means the tendering process, how is it being done, how the award process goes. It does not end over there. It's not just award process. After that, what happens to the downstream activity? Has it delivered? If you have delivered, has he, what was the packing? Was it in compliance? Let's say you're buying a DG goods, dangerous goods. It has some very special packing requirements. We're not sure whether DG packing has been done. That's a compliance requirement. It's not us who are guiding into it. There are requirements by the International Maritime Organization, IMO declares, saying what should be packed and how it should be done. All those, they become essential. But as you see, it is not just the sourcing, but even the delivery and acceptance, the shipping and all come into the play. Despite the above merit of saying that you get the visibility, cooperation and control, innovation and compliance programs have demerits such as cost saying that yeah if you you need to follow a certain pattern and you know you need to be compliant into it you need to follow the cost i'll, I'll give you a good example also once uh, not in this organization sorry also, uh, the sound sound is not clear i suppose because many of the participants are telling the sound is not clear. can you a little bit more audible can adjust the volume sorry for the no, no that's fine uh, i mean uh, please that, that's what we want we want people to People, three, four people have raised people that the sound is not, clear. is not clear. Yeah. Uh, yes, is it audible now? Is it clear? For me, it's clear, but the other people, that's what I'm telling. I turned off the AC. Maybe that's causing some uh, impedance. We never know. Let, let's wait for the feedback in the chat if somebody is saying any comment. All good, all good. All good. It's clear all now. Good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Maritas has joined us from Australia and she says, all good. Thank you. 
yeah santosh kadam says clear rahul also uh, royal is joined that's nice thank you rahul for joining all right so let's continue in this one so although we said that it gives you enhanced visibility cooperation control over it but then it has got uh, the element uh, cost element going into it saying that how many people are focused on investing some more additional funds into ensuring the compliance part into it so as i said this presentation purely focuses on the pros and cons of innovation versus compliance and see what are the challenges to be do so the agenda is defining and understanding compliance innovations definitions and strategies in case if you are going for innovation and compliance what is a forward looking approach and what are the behavioral aspects and ownership approach and then what are the controls you build in and how do these uh, control also control what we have given it to them right? and we need to control the controls as well that's an important element into it when when we are devolving the authority especially procurement you need to be very cautious out of it i know this is a little text heavy but uh, i'll try to make it um, as simple as possible simple definition compliance involves adhering to rules that's what it means the rules defined by either your own internal organization or by the government or by the international agency whatever rules have been defined you need to for example today if you want to move certain uh, flammable liquid oil on an aircraft or on a freighter it cannot be done why because it's it's not allowed why is it not allowed because of x y and z reasons and also iata giving the guiding principles into it and something similar has happened saying that okay you want to go across and say uh, i want to buy something but i don't want to follow the procurement policy it's it's not possible isn't it and and uh, whenever there is a request people people would have to understand saying how these requests are coming in and what is the demand what and end objective first try to understand what is the end objective and then you find out okay is this the right sourcing practice or not or what does it need do you need to go on a single source or multi source you want to run is it a one time requirement or is it like a recurring requirement where you just need one year or six months maybe it requires a five year program or three years program normally it was five years before it's toned down to three years because of the volatility in the market but then the, all these things uh, factors need to be assessed very cautiously yeah. so what does procurement uh, compliance uh, clearly say it says it entails developing implementing and enforcing systems for the firm expenditure management so as i said this is a upstream activity therefore when you are spending the amount of the organization irrespective of which stakeholder or which department it is yeah you need to follow the compliance measures into it and uh, another important part of uh, compliance which is saying that maverick buying i don't know how many of you are aware of this uh, concept called maverick buying which the users would like to take the control and they would like to go and uh, do the purchasing by themselves without following the policy process and let us say you have an agreement of uh, 10000 rials for a particular fuel transfer pump whereas in the maverick buying we notice that the user department has gone out and you know, sourced something else for 13500 okay i'm i'm just giving it an example it's, it's just a hypothetical it's not even pragmatic so then the point comes up for saying okay why did they go and buy this this is urgent okay if it is urgent did you take the approvals in place and why didn't you consult the procurement had you consulted procurement then they they would have shared uh, the contract rate saying that guys go to x service provider we have a rate contract in place and then you can source this product which has already been technically evaluated and it's readily available for 10000 whereas now the supplier uh, the stakeholder or the user department just in an excitement to go ahead and get the things done quickly they they have sourced a product at a much higher price and also we don't know whether it meets all the technical details on the spur of the moment people would have to take a decision they go across okay whatever is needed for the short term they do it but then when you look at it from a long term perspective when we look at strategic sourcing and all items many items are captured into it i'm not saying operational tools operational items no but on strategic items where you've got some high impact into it it's not just the price alone what happens after the after sales support the spares required the maintenance i mean complete as we speak it's not the tlc alone the tco concept has to be done which many of them they, they don't know about it 
So people would have to understand if procurement is enforcing certain compliance, why is it saying it? There is a reason behind it. And also the second part is contract leakage. In the sense, the same thing. Services, it's already contracted with X vendors and all, and people, they don't use that particular approved vendor and they go somewhere else. Then the perceived benefits of the contract are, are being lost. A company is being deprived of the benefits the savings and all and the supplier on the other side would be sitting and waiting saying that okay they gave a budget estimate of uh, 200,000 transactions in uh, three years whereas we only had 100,000 transactions where did the balance 100,000 go and they all went into the contract leakage and part of the maverick buying itself yeah so the, these are two main elements disadvantages which happen into it so we have to ensure that especially in the supply chain and procurement, all the end users and all, they understand the procurement policies and all. The disadvantage of compliance is that it is costly if a third party does not provide it. And at this moment, now I also want to give you an example from my previous uh, experience. Once I was in, you know, before joining Qatar, I was in Dubai. There, uh, one of the organization where I was working, there was an air curtain, which needs some repairs. We all know air curtain repair. It's like you look at the curtain and say, at the entrance door itself that I was very junior in the role and I had that task. I looked at it and said, okay, where can we get it? Who is the repair and all? I looked at the general air maintenance guys and I asked them, electrical maintenance guys. They saw it and they gave me a quotation of 17,000. But I went to my boss then, he said, Rao, you can't do it. And I was like, yeah, but can you tell me why I can't do it? He said, this is non-compliant pro procurement. And I was taken aback. I said, okay, I wanted to learn. I was, that's the early years of my career. I said. Uh, how is it non-compliant and what is it there? Then he said, uh, here you are appointing a person for 17,000 rials to go and then repair it. What happens if he falls from the ladder while he's repairing it? It is on our side. Who is responsible for it? And imagine the credibility issues. And second, he said, what if he is electrocuted over there? And I was like, mm -hmm. these are two important points which he mentioned. A small air curtain also. And those guys from the electrical department, they said, oh, it will take 70,000 to finish it. But then I had to go in, attach the terms and conditions, the contractual requirements, and then I forced them to sign it. And the same thing from 70,000 went up to 35,000 rials. So th that's what I said. It, it has a cost element associated with it. Definitely there is a cost element. And compliance has a premium. And also, apart from this cost element, Many people, they find that it's a lengthy process as well. So we, we try to, one side, we, we are rushing out. On the other side, we can't pull it back. Th therefore, it becomes very essential that, you know, we need to balance it and then move further into it. I hope that's clear into it. I can see already some questions popping up in the Q&A. We will answer after the session, please. We take note of the Q&A and we will reply you accordingly. Now let's look at the innovation. Innovation involves effectively implementing a novel concept. Agreed. Innovation word itself defines saying it's a novel concept and it's creating value for consumers and stakeholders. So as we said, uh, I gave the example of illegal diamond and then blockchain. How is it going to help it? Now, innovation in supply chain implies enhancements to the supply chain operations by increasing productivity. See, that, that's a catch here. Increasing productivity, optimizing cost, and processing times, of course, it gives you the transparency as well, which we just discussed uh, in the previous slides. And what really happens? Uh, it also helps you in simplifying the scope for prediction. You can take a pragmatic approach in identifying future tasks and obligations in that, okay, next uh, six months, who is planning to go on leave? Okay, so and so, I'm just giving an example. That's also one of those uh, critical areas. And you know, they take care of your staff and they come for you and say, I've got so many contracts that are due for renewal. And these are the tasks which we have. Uh, when we have those tasks on hand with us, definitely, it, it raises to a point saying that, okay, now those tasks, that's a workload coming. What is the complexity on it? Can it be handled by the existing staff? Or not? I'm just giving you uh, a quick example of the manpower related things. But having said that, Strategic sourcing when we do it, and these sort of activities can help in combining the volumes and then you negotiate based on the economies of scale. Now, playing future tasks and obligation, you, you exactly know which year what you're getting it. You know, if, if everything is properly um, captured within your systems 
and it is it is very important and you can combine your contracts and you'll get a visibility saying that okay with the, some x supplier you already have four contracts in place with various expiry dates how do we do it so th there are a lot more benefits into it when you are going into the innovative supply chain uh, modernization or digitization you can call it and also investing in essential data standardization is the key okay there is a pen in my hand the, the nomenclature should be defined about it it's not a uh, blue pen some would say pen blue some would say ball pen some would say gel pen that what really happens here now we spoke about four different skus here for the same item so standardization is the key and how do we standardize it is define the major category minor category then attributes go into it and you need to have the proper segmentation going into it and also when we talk about the innovations and all people sometimes they say that okay mr rao if you have to invest into an ERP system and all, it's going to be a very expensive affair for us. I don't know whether we get value for money. And sometimes we had a SAR experience with an X, Y, and Z. So I give an example saying that start small. Don't, don't, don't uh, go and then uh, pester your boss saying that, you know, I need uh, half a million for automating my documents. You know, I need digital signatures and all this. You know, start, start with small, I would say. For example, I've given a new example here, small example on the Excel. There are so many features in Excel, online sharing. But definitely, sharing, SharePoint is something which we have. It We will be having the communities or let us say Microsoft planners are there and all. So with these tools, when you start sharing the details and all, the likelihood, you know, the collaboration will identify the problems if there are any problems. Of course, nobody would like to create a deliberate issue with that, but uh, inadvertently, sometimes we do have these issues coming in. So it can be addressed. You know, when somebody gets a time, they'll be reviewing the documents. Ah, something is wrong here. It cannot be true. Yes, let's check it out thoroughly. And it, it helps. Rather than waiting for the actual big chunk to be approved and then implementation cost and integration, it's a big ball game. So rather than that, it's better to start small. And also I was mentioning, uh, I'll take this opportunity to mention one of the innovations which started is 3D printing. I don't know. It's This has been the latest trend which is happening. Amazon does printing in their truck for the toys while it is delivering the product. That is an amazing, amazing innovation. Uh, so many things are happening here. Right? First of all, toys, when they're making it, okay, is it coming from some country in the Far East, which I don't want to name? Then is there a child labor abuse over there? I don't know. What are the other parameters over there? Are they really having harsh uh, human rights conditions, X, Y, and Z? However, when you know that, you know, this is being printed on a truck, which is on the delivery to you, you are assured about it, saying that, yeah, 3D printing and the toys are coming. So it is a sustainable toy and ethically printed. Ethically printed 3D toy. Yeah. So innovation, that, that's what we're saying here. And now uh, let, let's look at the uh, forward looking approach. You know? And uh, brother, let me know, you know, if you want me to slow down or what, you know, I don't want to rush. It's a good topic. I want to give live. No, it's, okay. You know? yeah. it's okay. Fine, Mr. Rao. You're perfect. You're perfectly going on. If anything is there, I'll surely bother you or disturb you. Don't worry about it. Carry on, carry on. It's going, going on. So when we say about the forward looking approach, you must think about the compliance so that ethics and compliance become an integral part of the supply chain management. I mean, the complete, when I say supply chain management, procurement is part of supply chain management. It's not a different subject altogether. Many people, they say, no, I'm uh, supply chain. I'm not procurement. I said, no, then where is procurement coming from? You know, uh, let's say logistics. I said, okay, where is logistics? Logistics is also part of supply chain management. It's not separate. When we say supply chain management, it's end-to-end -end or cradle to grave, they call it. Some people, they call it source to settle. And P2P is a very old uh, terminology. But these days, things are changing. In supply chain management also is called as value stream management. I mean, it's enhancing. The responsibilities are moving away. But very importantly, the guidelines of this particular compliance must be dynamic. It must be inventive. Adaptable is the point. There is no point if it is not adaptable. It's like uh, we make a policy and all, and half the uh, company may not be able to understand it. That, that, that's, a, that's a challenge. So it should be adaptable and behavior focused to meet this need. 
while still being consistent with the business rules. So that, that's very important for the forward-looking approach. That's very essential to it. So I don't know how many of you do the uh, smart technique. You know, we have a SMART smart technique whenever we are trying to gauge the performance and all specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. Some something similar, you know, saying that it is it should be relevant to that and it should be time bound and it should be achievable. But don't just give something which is non-achievable or something which cannot be. Uh, we just say, okay, uh, we need to build a tower bigger than Burj Al Arab or uh, Burj Khalifa. Said, okay, we'll do that. What is the timeline for it? Maybe within uh, one year. These sort of things are like just loose talks. This is nothing. It's not going to happen. That, that needs a serious planning into it, and you need to have lots of resources. So gauging the project itself, you as the subject matter expert, you've got all the rights to go back and raise the questions into it. I still remember uh, uh, in my previous role uh, when I was uh, in charge of sourcing some very specific equipment, which needs, which has a production lead time of 16 weeks. I still remember. Production requirement, uh, production lead time is 16 weeks. The transit time is uh, six weeks at the time, transit time from a particular location. So typical production plus transit lead time is 22 weeks. So let's take one week for the customs clear because it's something different equipment. But the user raises a requisition with a need by date of next week. So that, uh, that, that is a challenge. So are they really thinking, are they doing a project management here? Are they really serious? That's what is the question. For that reason, none of these uh, uh, projects are 80% of the projects, they fail World War. Why means the timelines are unrealistic. People should understand it. And that's very important. The efficacy of a project, it, it all depends on how well we work at the beginning itself in establishing the relevant milestones. And then these milestones, when they, okay, a certain project, you know the milestones. And then you say, okay, let's say procurement department comes into the play and they say, what is procurement department doing here with all these details? So how long do you need to source a product? I say, I need six months to source a product. Then he will be out of the job. In six months, if you're taking six months to only source a requirement, when will it be produced and when will it be delivered and when will we be using it? That means, do we need to do the next year's procurement now? In this volatile climate where we have all been impacted by corona, where the consumption have gone totally erratic, how can we predict it? Saying that what tools you put into the play, what algorithms will come into the play? You know, at present uh, in the logistics also this morning, I was at another event and one of our colleagues raised an excellent point saying, that, look at the logistics cost, what it was, what it, what it has been and where is it now? all this thing and how much of hedging can we do it? Huh? So in order to deal with these things and especially forward-looking approach can be addressed by definitely what we are saying is you need to have a collaborative approach. So I've been always saying in, in the procurement itself saying procurement was first reactive saying that okay the buyer will sit and say okay use a Excuse me, Sharaf. Sharaf. I, but then I think uh, something went yeah, wrong. Yeah, 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 fine, fine. Sorry, sir. Your background, correct? Sorry. Yeah, uh, get it, get it. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. Yeah, sorry. Very clear. Okay. I, know, I lost the floor. No, I was saying something else. Yeah, as I was saying, the, the evolvement of procurement, earlier it was more reactive in nature. In the sense, people used to sit and wait for a requisition to come to action it. And then uh, things changed. Things changed from reactive to proactive. In the sense, okay, then procurement started taking lead and said, okay, guys, tell me what is the plan you have for this year and next year so that I can plan my resources. Uh, I need to plan my effort and let's plan a step. Negotiation strategy, the management. That's also good. But then what is the next level? I said, next level is a collaborative approach. Saying that unless we sit together with the stakeholder, change from user mentality mindset to the stakeholder, sit with them, understand the requirement and say that, okay, we have been doing it the same manner. If they've been buying this pen for so many years, it not necessarily does not mean they have to buy the same thing. Maybe there is an alternative. 
this is plastic pen and is plastic sustainable? Plastic is not sustainable. It's not biodegradable. So why not look at alternate products? So when you sit with the stakeholders and collaboratively develop certain things, then the long-term business is there for everybody. Sustainable products are there. And, 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 and that's already begun, actually. It's begun. It's happening. And I've seen companies adapting this approach saying, now, thanks to government of Qatar, I see that they don't allow the plastic cups. That's wonderful move. I truly appreciate the government moves here. Many people, they say, no, no, why not plastic? Plastic, in 1980s, I was a school kid at the time. You know, I've, I used to feel shy when my mother used to give me a bag. I know it was a cotton bag to buy some vegetables, groceries and all. I would say, this is old fashioned. Look, people have gone to plastic and all. But then we didn't realize it today. There is one continent full of plastic floating in the sea, which it's impacting the marine life and we are eating the same fish. And if you look at the biodegradability of that product, it's not going to degrade in, in hundreds of years. Those are the challenges. Although it may seem like, okay, it's a short-term benefit. Carrying a plastic pouch was uh, a style at the time. We're talking the 1980s. Having a blue color uh, packet. And I, I used to ride a bicycle. Underneath the seat, I used to always carry a polythene cover, saying that, okay, I have to buy some fruits and all. I'm going to put in that and show flash nice. But it's not, not today we have gone back to the old days. We recommend the jute bags. Or many of them, they, they go for alternate bags, saying that the cloth bags and all. And you, you must have noticed that uh, um, supermarkets like Monopri and all, they give the paper bags. So there is this thought process which should have been there in the 80s we adapted for something. So we don't want that to happen. That is forward looking approach for all of us. And especially in, in the procurement, because when we are procuring a product, I know there is a certain cost element into it. If you're looking for the short term benefits, this is what is the danger that you, know, you need to have that forward looking approach itself. And when you have a forward looking approach and you change your approach saying that it will be a collaborative in a sense when we're doing it, a lot of things can be achieved. Now let's look at it. This is a very interesting thing. This was uh, uh, two next two slides are shared by one of my good friends. He sent it last evening, and I said I should definitely include it. You know, when we say regulatory requirements and then you know technological things, they say regulatory tortoise and technology hare. Like we we all know the story of the tortoise and the hare, saying that okay they began on a race, then hare was overconfident, it slept, and therefore tortoise won, saying consistency won. Okay, slow and steady wins the race. But then there is a second part of the story where hair is conscious and they say, let's start the race. And then hair does not take rest. It does not sleep. And then hair wins and, and tortoise is slowly moving. In. There is a third part into it. Recently, I was saying, there is a water uh, stream in between the race and then hair goes there and waits and tortoise crosses it and then tortoise wins it again. The fourth part into it. When they are on the land, just concept wise, the hare carries the tortoise, it goes until the stream. And while in the stream, the tortoise is swimming, hare is sitting on top of the tortoise and they're crossing the stream and then both of them cross the river and that's is called an innovative approach. Collaboration. And that's what we say, transform and simply compliance by reducing data duplication and it creates visibility. You, you need to identify the areas where you can really uh, work together and, and you, you have to make some unprecedented changes here. No? And that, that's what is it. No? The society and environmental compliances are there and you cannot do it alone in procurement. I'm telling you, you are waging a war against yourself. Not everyone will support you unless you've been a user department and you're heading the department or you're sitting so high there up in the chair that you can dictate terms. But if you want to wage your warms, you, you need to really ensure that all these points are duly addressed. And then another important point is empower organization to become more ethical, compliant, and resilient. And of course, as we said, the policies to be done into it. Every policy must also have an SOP associated with that. Policy will tell you what to do. Process will tell you how to do it. So let's not mix it. And people should understand and prepare these documents. Yeah. I hope it's interesting until now. I've seen some comments in the chat, but uh, we will address all of it, please. 
This is again another slide which my friend has sent to me, and I want to show you the benefits of streamlining compliance by using innovative technology. And believe you me, this is something I think the, the key for today, this is the key. Saying that in banking, how did the innovation help us in, in coming up with the compliance? Robotic process automation, RPA. It's for operational efficiency in reporting trade repositories, integrating front with the backend system without much human intervention. These sort of things are like, earlier it was not possible, but now you see the compliance perspective also, it's being done with the innovative methods. Natural language processing for KYC verification. Yeah, I don't know how many of you filled the documents for the KYC, you know, and call them and do it, give a photograph with a check into it. And a lot of things are there for onboarding the clients and all. But when you do the natural language processing or the NLP here, so it, it makes the process easy. And then artificial intelligence or the machine learning also is, is one of the important parts. Machine learning is evolving so much so that it's, it's able to do a lot of predictions as well using it. This morning, uh, I was uh, talking to somebody here and they said with the machine learning algorithms, he predicts that the FIFA football final is going to be England versus Argentina. Then I said, uh, it's good, but how did you derive it? He said, I heard someone doing these algorithms into the system and all, and the system is able to give it. How is it doing it? It's all nothing but the machine learning. And he is so confident. He says that the last three World Cups, this is what has happened here, saying whatever was predicted by that particular machine and the person had come out true. I said, that's good to know. Uh, I'm very happy that something like that is happening. And let's wait and see how it is coming. You can also note it down and <laughs> let's see how it comes in. England versus Argentina to be the, in the final for uh, Qatar FIFA World Cup. Uh, let's wait and see. This is on a lighter note. <laughs> on the, uh, I'm going to address four different um, fields here. On the aviation sector, the air cargo tariff and rules is called the TACT, uh, TACT rules, allow real time search of the rate and all. And that's possible. You know, whenever it is rates, it becomes sensitive and uh, it needs to comply. But with the innovation of it, everything is being fed into the system and then people are able to access it. And then it becomes very, very easy for everyone to ensure the business is run across. And when it comes to the uh, aviation business, it's time is of essence. Time is a luxury we cannot afford into it. And then it, things have to move swiftly. Another important element is uh, ground handling integrated management solutions or the IMX. Uh, it's uh, ground handling is not easy when you are into it. Of course, I'm in the airline. I'm not talking of the Qatar Airways. I'm talking of the other uh, ground handlers, which happens, uh, let's say so many ground handlers are, let's take an example of the Swiss port or Menzies or worldwide flight services, uh, Denata. It's got man involvement in it. That's a human involvement and there is a equipment also which goes into it. And then for especially cargo handling, all there was warehouse as well. So integrating all of it, ensuring the safety of it and all, it takes a lot of time and several items are very confidential. And these things have to be performed in accordance with the IATA compliance rules. So the compliance part comes into the play again, but with the IMX solutions, it, it makes it easier. And then it really takes it to the next level. And uh, let, let's not forget the passenger travel compliance, uh, thematic, you know, automated travel documents. So that, that also is uh, very, very essential and it contains classified data but with the thematic and knowledge protected appropriately. And also at this point of time, I just want to remind you all, when you travel, uh, don't throw your boarding pass away. I know this is the WhatsApp knowledge which I'm sharing with you. They say that when you scan those barcode, you can find the details about your travel. So be very careful. Do not throw your uh, uh, boarding passes. When you come home, tear it, let them go into the dustbin. Now let's look at the third field, shipping. In the shipping, of course, we all know what challenges we had in during the last one to two years. Uh, so many issues had come in, specifically when it comes to the uh, blank sailings, equipment and availability, Far East closures, uh, and then you know condition of the ports and all. But then we said, uh, what really happens? Where is my container? Can we track it? There are some free websites available where people go and put in the BL number or the container number to track it down and all. But with the uh, example set by the Maersk, you know, they partnered with the IBM to leverage blockchain. Now, and then they're saying that visibility can be given straight away saying from where it is originating and how it is being sorted out. 
that that's a good achievement by musk itself and i don't know how many of you are aware but musk i think is also positioning uh, two cruise vessels in qatar for the fifa thing so a lot, lot of movements musk has um, also moved to the next level they are also planning to go into the air freight so from the sea that diversifying into it good for musk now another example i want to cite is amazon alexa it is like we, we all know alexa it's an example of uh, uh, system run uh, natural language chatbot you know it, it provides information on the rates as well so shipping rates for example if you need a 40 foot container rate coming in from Gongzhou to doha you know, go and ask it and then if it is you you will get the current rates what you have in. however forward looking rates six months down the point well, six months down the line what will be the rate that it's, it's not unknown. If you look at the Drury reports and the Freitos Baltic Index and all, you can see the rate sliding down. If you want to hedge your rate based on the current price, you are more than welcome to do it. However, going further, yeah, just going for a one month rate or two months rate into it. So there been big debate going on saying that is spot rate better or the contract rate better? So that is a never ending story. And I was listening to that conversation very closely. It was from the US uh, organizer middle of the night and, and I really wanted to see it, you know, what they are concluding in it. I could see they didn't conclude it. <laughs> the argument was going on into it and nobody can make out. Somebody said, no, it is 50-50, you know, 50% on the contract, 50% on the spot rates. So we leave it to the people. Uh, and let's look at the Bluetooth also. Delta has created the IoT network with the Bluetooth to provide real-time tracking of the ULD. ULD is a unique loading device, which is a aluminum container, which gets into, sorry, aluminum was a previous technology. Now we do have the, only the um, extrusions are aluminum, but whereas it's a twin text material or lightweight material, we have it. That's where the baggage goes into it. And they, they have created the Bluetooth technology you know, to track your ULDs. ULDs is like when they go to the station, they get stuck over there. So getting it back and all it becomes a challenge. Therefore, it's, it's a good technology. And again, that's a compliance requirement, but it's been addressed with the innovations. Now, the fourth element is, let's look at the customs. Very, very sensitive area. Uh, I hope my colleague uh, Taha is not here. We call him the Mukhatil, thank God. Or uh, you should see his phone always, he is so busy trying to resolve things and all. Think customs, they say it is not easy. But yeah, once you get on with the EDIs, this is the integration with the EDIs when I mention it. Once you do into it, then the declarations can be done. And we, we can also work on the pre-clearance as well for it. And then you have got the next option of uh, smart sensors and scanners. And then let us not forget about the drones. We all know drones. Many countries now they're adopting uh, the drone deliveries and all. But then again, uh, it raises points. There, there are pros and cons both the way saying that, okay, is it uh, carrying the legal goods, illegal goods and all? That is again, we, we need to, innovation should be done in a compliant manner itself. So there'll be some protection which comes into the play. They will check the boots in between inspections and all of that by the Customs and Border Protection or CBP very popularly known as. Let's, let's look at the next slide. This slide focuses on the behavioral approach aspect or the ownership approach. Except. I would say it's got to be uh, equal emphasis on behavioral components saying that it's got to be uh, ownership approach as well, but you should not jump into too much into it. And uh, you, you need to ensure that all your people who are involved in, in, the, in the decision making system are aware about the policies, procedures and all, and they, they should understand the importance of compliance. What happens if you don't comply? There's sensitive departments like procurement, as I mentioned in the beginning itself, you know, we, are, we are prone to the audits and then there'll be a lot of Cases also, I've noticed some cases in my previous organization where people were uh, taken to task and all and there were legal proceedings against them. So uh, the why compliance courses and all, the little, this will assist them saying to understand, giving when you cite these examples, this will really uh, increase their knowledge also on the compliance needs and it strengthens uh, procurement uh, a lot. The procurement person would benefit out of it. Saying people also do understand when we are saying something from procurement, saying, guys, we need to do it in a certain manner to ensure. And th there's no harm, you know, make them sit next to you and open up your plan and explain them in each milestone, saying, what are we trying to do here? What is the plan? And then you draw down the SLS saying, okay, I'll get the tender at this date. 
and I will open the uh, technical bit first. I will give it to you. How long do you need for an evaluation? You can do the technical evaluation and give back to you. Uh, and then let's agree, you know, if they need a site visit, how long do you need for a site visit? Or if you want some samples for evaluation, the best thing is to do a blind sampling, please, on a common goods. Blind sampling is needed. Or if they need any further assessment by third party and all. Okay, all those things first jot it even before you start the RFQ process itself. So that any of the element overstepping the timelines and all, you, you will be able to spot it right from the beginning and then you can correct it. So it, it's very essential. Huh? We, we need to take that uh, approach uh, and then educate the user departments and, and the stakeholders mostly. And then we also say it is critical to have a structure that facilitate compliance and incorporates it into day-to-day -day duties of every member of the business. It's not one, it's, it's got to be compliant by every member. And uh, uh, other easy way of action is, you know, nominate the champions for each of these things, compliance champions for each division. And then they, they can do the audits and all, and then it, it helps. It serves uh, their own interest and also organization to benefit from these sort of activities. You, know? you can say champions may act as an extension arm of compliance department and uh, bridging the gap between the trust and integrity in the business. That's, that's, that's key, integrity in the business, trust and integrity. For that reason, periodic audits or random audits can be done by them just to ensure that the documents are in compliant or X, Y, and Z buyer has followed the process or uh, so into supplier has delivered on time and it's captured. No, it's not delivered, but it's not captured. All those things can be addressed into it. And uh, it also serves as observers providing helpful insight into the field situations no? that uh, utilize to fine tune your compliance regulations as well. No? And believe you me, all these are, would definitely add to your bottom line success. Now, building controls and control these controls. This is a very important part, uh, which I said it, and the previous slide also links here, saying that when we are devolving the or empowering the authority onto something onto an individual in, in the department or decentralizing, it is essential that you also capture in saying that what they can do and how they can do and what they cannot do it. And the, the control should be there. And I, I would give you a tool, uh, RACI matrix, R-A-S-C-I, you know, or the latest version is A-R-P-A. You know, uh, RACI matrix is like, uh, who is responsible, who is uh, accountable for it, and who is supporting it, you know, and all those things. But when it comes to the uh, uh, ARPA model, who is accountable, responsible participant, and who is the advisor, it, it clearly identifies the, the roles of each of the players saying, okay, they can do this, and they cannot do this. That, that's very important because this is a sensitive operation in the, in, the, in the ACM. And how does it look like, you know, one guy from the planning department, he is calling X supplier and says, I'm going to release an inquiry for 200 of uh, tractors. I need uh, agricultural tractors, 200. I'm going to release an inquiry. Can you just give me your specifications now at the beginning itself and all? So like, okay, he gets an edge over others here. Saying that, okay, he's preparing himself saying that, okay, there is 200 so he can prepare his production plans, he can reduce the lead time. And this is an information which is going out even before the actual tender process has begun. So that, that's a breach of compliance. However, he can ask saying that I'm trying to build in a, a specification, we need your support in building it. There could be an inquiry coming in and how can we speak about it? So the, the tone change or the scope change will make a lot of difference here. And it's important that we in the procurement, we ensure that we control it. And uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, I'll tell you the tools of RASI and ARPA, they're very interesting tools. And continuous improvement, as I've been mentioning, continuous innovation is required to implement a system-based strategy to integrate compliance controls into corporate operations. And if you are approving, if you're giving the approval authorities into it, please form a matrix and then assign the systems into it. System can easily go up to, let's say an approval up to 500,000 should reach a vice president or general manager, then it should reach a general manager. A manager can approve up to 100,000 or 50,000, whatever is assigned, the role-based approvals can be set. Or in case you go devolving the authority to anybody else, saying, okay, inventory items can be done or the expense items, that way build, your controls can be built. And then these controls also should be audited and periodic audits are essential to it. 
Well, this brings us to the last slide, but we'll open up the question and answer session. It said, what is happening? What does it mean saying that compliance was innovation? Value proposition, value communication, value creation, value delivery, value capture may all be influenced through supply chain innovation. That's what I said. You know? And it's no longer called supply chain, it's called the value stream management. There is flexibility for business to create a supply chain compliant solution that is unique to their operations and values. We cannot say that one size fits all approach. No, it does not work across. Uh, I've seen organizations uh, where you've got the uh, oil producing or gas industries, non-oil producing industries, aluminum producing industries, aviations, every industry has got different compliance solutions. And yes, it can be customized for the requirement. Uh, last but not least, although innovation and compliance may be costly, outsourcing supply chain compliance management can be a cost-effective alternative. In a sense, uh, let's say for uh, pre-delivery inspection, normally for when you are accepting uh, important equipment and all, you go to the other part, other side of the world, and then you sit down and say, okay, let me do a pre-delivery inspection, then I put a tick mark, you can ship the equipment. The same thing, it can be done by outsourcing to third-party companies. For example, I'm not promoting Bureau Veritas, but I'm saying Bureau Veritas offers a service saying that, let's say you have ordered some items from Spain, rather than you going all the way to Spain and doing it, if you could share the specification with them, of course, it's not free. There's no free lunch here. So you agree with uh, Bureau Veritas saying that, okay, I have this requirement. I want to complete the PDI to be done. And yes, they do have tools and uh, techniques and methods and it's increasing side as well. So this is a cost-effective alternate as well. For it. Uh, lots of things are there and uh, please don't get swayed away when somebody says that uh, I'm ISO, I'm sending it. No, 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 guys. ISO, when you say it, it's the manufacturing process, right? And they are only certifying that the process, what you what is being followed, saying, okay, it goes in, okay, this is a step, this is an X step, Y step, Z step, and all steps in the process. But then garbage in is garbage out. If your product which is going in is not right, what is coming out the end product is not right. Hence, you need to have a quality control in place to ensure, and this quality control or the pre-delivery inspections before were done by the individual organizations. Now it can be outsourced to a third party as well at some cost into it. That's, uh, some quick note, but I, what I will say is that compliance and innovation should always work hand in hand. And that's when we'll be achieving it. Well, that's for today. Thank you. Now we'll open the chat, uh, Mr. Badr, for uh, checking out the question and answer session, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rao. It was indeed a very innovative speech. And I hope so. We have a lot of question and answer uh, sessions are there. Uh, followed, we have uh, question answers around 11 questions I can see here. And hope we can answer uh, by not wasting much of time. Can we start with question and answer, Mr. Rao? Are you comfortable? Yeah, yeah definitely. Let, let's, let's begin with that. Okay, fine. No problem. So here is uh, one of our uh, participants, uh, Mr. Ishwar Padbanathan. In fact, his, uh, most of the question is from him only. Okay. So let me compile this one. So he started with the question, how do you differentiate between compliance and rules? And the other wow. question was, I, is, is compliance an umbrella of complicacy? Well, compliance, okay, let, let's take all three together. No? He's got three questions. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, another one is, well, compliance ensure no mapping by, 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 by his, yeah. yeah. Mr. Just Ishwar, uh, I trust you're doing well. Uh, good to see that you're participating and uh, you're asking a question. Very interesting questions uh, today. While you're driving on the road, you are supposed to drive on the right side of the road. When you're driving on the right side of the road, that means you are complying with the traffic rules. And if somebody is not driving on the compliant way, then he's breaking the rules. It, it, it's simple. So even in the procurement, you set certain compliance saying that, okay, guys, in the compliance module, you are not supposed to meet the supplier outside X, Y, and Z or for these reasons. If they're, And there, there is a rule here saying that, you know, even if you're meeting him, there is a reason for it. But beyond that, 
if you're not following it, then you're breaking the rules here. Uh, and then you say, uh, will compliance ensure no maverick buying? We are issuing the rules. We are issuing the rules. And if you have a system, a foolproof system to ensure that uh, the maverick buying and the contract leakage is addressed, then yes, it will definitely ensure there is no maverick buying. And th th that's what we are building in, saying that how do we use the innovation to ensure that whatever is being done in this upstream activities and all, we need to definitely address it through the innovations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rao. There is another question uh, from uh, Ms. Uh, Fadila Al-Sharaf, Mrs. Maybe or Miss. I'm sorry about that. Uh, the question is, when we talk about innovation, do you think that the current procurement process is effective for more innovative projects? Can I repeat the question or you can uh, see that, Mr. Rao? No, I can see the question and uh, okay. thank you. Yes. It's, it's a very good question actually, but then it depends how is your procurement process? No? How, how is it defined? Like, are you involving right from the day the idea is being generated? You know? Sometimes when we sit across in a lunch or pantry and all, and the thought process come across saying, I should have a logistic system or I should have a system which can predict and tell me where exactly is X, Y, and Z. I said, and uh, I should have a system which should predict even the uh, port strikes and also the climatic thing. Okay, now these are some areas which are coming in. There's, there's no uh, restriction on that. Let's uh, address the weather patterns. For weather patterns, everyone goes onto the website and checks across saying, okay, what weather is that? Similarly, if you integrate the same weather pattern into your logistics system and say that, you know, what ports are there and are there any alerts going on at the port? or if there is any strike going at the port. Recently, uh, Liverpool, I think, or uh, yeah, Liverpool followed by Felix, so there was a strike. If you have a system uh, and then which it can integrate to the others and all and collect the information, that is the innovation which I'm talking of from whether the port services or the weather services, then it, it really helps you in, in, in uh, streamlining your process. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, in fact, uh, thank you, Mr. Rao. There's another question from Mr. Iswar Padmanadan, but anyhow, we'll try to give some other people also a chance and I'll come back to you about the question from Iswar Padmanadan. There's one Mr. Rajesh uh, Yaramasthi. Uh, his question is, how can we access the integrity of supply chain while implementing innovation and stick compliances? Uh, Mr. Rajesh, thank you for your question. Uh, hope you're doing well. Uh, good question. How can we assess the integrity of supply chain while implementing innovation on strict compliance? When you say that you're coming across on the strict compliance itself, you are ensuring that the system is duly protected. So that, that itself will do it. And as I mentioned, periodic audits, depending on it, saying that you can run your statistics to see how the spend is uh, moving across, saying that is it a high spend, is it low spend, or is it complicated, and certain sort of things like when you see high value items turned around within seven days, then it, it raises an eyebrow everywhere. Like how did uh, 3 million transaction go within seven days I mean, from the RFQ to the PO? Those, uh, you, you need to put in those controls into it. And especially when you're saying strict compliance, that itself will address it. Only thing is that you need to build in your audit controls into it. And you increase the frequency depending on the elements of uh, surprise, like what we said, RFQ to PO in seven days, high value, let's say five, not 3 million, say 5 million. And then you say, put in other controls, regular uh, audits, and that should uh, control it. And take uh, take my word, if you are applying these uh, random audits, you'll see a lot more over there. Indeed, thank you very much, Mr. Rao. I'll go on to other uh, questions from other participants also, as well. There is Mr. Mohammed uh, Talha or Taha, I don't know, his name is not coming. His question is, what are the most important and necessary aspect process practices for a successful procurement function. Mr. Mohammed Tamimi, thank you so much for the question. I hope you're doing well. Uh, what I suggest is implementing the category management will definitely help you in your successful procurement function. Category management, it not only gives you an idea of your current spend, what is happening and what exactly you need to focus on. In, in category, there are five steps and I've always been promoting uh, Jonathan O'Brien's model into it. And that really helps you. You, you, you understand uh, the process, you take it. And then 
identifying the current spend, what is it going, and you put it in the Krilgic matrix to identify the fourth quarter, what is happening in the fourth quarter. You target that and you can see, I mean, I'm not saying just the fourth quarter alone. You, you can see other elements also into it, but the success is category management and you should encourage the topic of it and also train your buyers or the managers whoever are doing it. It's very essential that they are trained into it. Recently, I was conducting an event on the Inco terms and people, when I say a total landed cost, they mistook it for total cost of ownership, whereas TLC is part of TCO. And then I explained to them saying that, guys, you are just saying CFR, but CFR does not include the insurance. Are you aware of it? No, but it says CFR, bring it here until it brings it. I said, okay, CFR is not including the insurance. CIF is including the insurance of the goods into it. Are, are you putting in something extra for the insurance and all? And what is it happening? And then FOB and all, a lot of things are being done. So it is essential that the person who is into the sourcing activity is aware of all the nuances within the procurement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rao. Indeed, this was a very good answer. I hope so. And then we will move to other uh, participant, Ajay Punjabi, Mr. Ajay Punjabi. He has a question, to what extent shall compliance principles be held on if it's slowing down the innovative technology? The question is from Mr. Ajay Punjabi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ajay. Thank you for the question. I hope you're doing well. And with regards to your question, it depends on the complexity of the procurement within your organization and how flexible are you in assigning it the leverages, you know, that you are doing it yourself, you, are, you have empowered your user department or stakeholders to do it, or what are the levels of the procurement? And depending on that, then we can look at uh, the strict compliance measures. No, we cannot say that the compliance is totally holding it back. Compliance is there only for your protection, nothing else. But some people, they feel that, you know, oh, if I have to comply with it, I have to follow six months of it. And I just sit with them and check what exactly is the compliance and what are the bottlenecks happening over there and what is causing the delay. And once you identify those bottlenecks at all, when addressed appropriately, all these things will be very easy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rao. There's a lot of questions are still going on in the Q&A session also in the chats. Anyhow, we'll go to another question from Kalai Selvam Michael. Mr. Kalai Selvam Michael has a question. Can compliance can be built into business continuity process managing crisis? Uh, Mr. Kalai, uh, thank you so much for your question. Hope you're doing well. And this is a very interesting question which you asked. Now, managing crisis is a different ballgame altogether. Uh, when it is a matter of crisis and you're addressing it, you know, there was a question when I was doing some audit training while I was in my previous organization. They said that uh, aircraft full of people and someone is standing in front of an aircraft with a rocket launcher threatening them saying, you pay me $10,000 or I'm going to hit you. So you can see that, you know, doing those sort of activities. And like, I'm talking of uh, hostile territories and you're in a hostile territory. Someone comes in like that and demands it. As per the uh, company policy, you're not supposed to pay them. But in such a situation where you're trying to manage a crisis where uh, the commander or the pilot is the commander responsible for the lives of 300 people, then what do you do is like, are you waiting for $10,000 or follow compliance or save the lives of 300 people in the aircraft? The point is saving the lives of the people and then you need to document it accordingly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rao. Then we'll move on to some other questions are there uh, from, uh, it is done, from Mr. Gopal Mutayala. Uh, his question is, most innovative innovation are disruptive, that is blockchain, but sometimes not compliance. How we ensure that compliance goes hand in hand with innovation? A good question, Mr. Gopal Mutayala. I hope you're doing well. Yes, I'm not saying it's 100% true. And that is the reason we said, you know, the technology is there to support us. And it's not the out of the world saying things can happen because we just implemented X, Y, and Z. You have to understand that everything has got certain limitations and it depends on the way we are modeling it. Because the procurement process, if you ask me 10 steps, request P has come in, let's have the quantities, do we have the uh, units of measure into, do you have the budget? go into the market, bring the quotations, blah, 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 until the order is placed and then comes the downstream action. However, this is the generic one, but what does your organization have? And you say most innovations are disruptive. 
Well, I tend to slightly disagree with you. I, I beg to disagree on that because you may be coming from your perspective, which is right. Uh, but most of the time, innovations are very good. Uh, recently, I was um, going through an article which said the hydrogen powered uh, vehicles have entered into the market. And now you see the electric vehicles which are happening across the world and Tesla is ruling it in the US. It's not the Middle East now though. But you see things come across, innovations are always good for it. And uh, when you see the lithium ion battery which we have it in today, with the normal phone, I still remember, <coughs> years back, <coughs> Uh, Alfred Toffler is a person who wrote a book called Future Shock. Whatever was there in that uh, book, my professor used to say that, he used to call me Srinivas Rao. But because Srinivas is my actual name, Rao is the name given by the Middle East. <laughs> and then the professor Sundaram used to tell me, you know, read the Alfred Toffler book, you know, he tells you what's going to happen in the future. And then when I read the book and all, I said, was this is all uh, imagining, uh, is it possible? Uh, maybe he's assuming things and all. But no, today, Sitting here, I can talk to my son who is in the USA. I can video call. I can see what is he doing. And also I can track down if I see his movements as well. All these things, they're only imaginary at one point of time. Today, the technology has reached to a certain extent. It's beyond imagination. Same thing 25 years back, if you had spoken about and saying, imagine, uh, as to Gopal, if you're sitting and saying that, okay, guys, I can uh, make a video call and then talk to a person over there and see what they're doing. They would not believe it. That was a time when the multimedia was taking into the picture. It was just being developed at the time. But now this is a reality. Uh, I think everybody here has got a smartphone, if not one, two or more. And then all the features are being utilized. So, uh, that, that, that's the reason I said, no, sometimes they're disruptive. Disruptive is right. Facebook, WhatsApp, they're disruptive. <laughs> You know, when you're in the middle of a meeting, you see some messages coming across and all. And when you're in the middle of a conversation, yeah, WhatsApp groups are created. Groups created for education is fine, but for the disruptive activities, they're bad. So it, it is like two sides of a coin. How are we using it? If you use it positively, everything should be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rao. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions more, if you don't mind. Uh, 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 another question from Mr. Abdurrahman Muhammad. Uh, do you think supply chain, this is already answered, I suppose. No, do you think supply chain compliance yeah, will I face much is, lag? Uh, it's a question which we answered before, but Abdurrahman, uh, thank you for the question and hope you're doing well. It's like, it okay. depends on your management, how strong you can demonstrate to them. What I suggest is if you go and give them the pep talk, nothing is going to happen. I'm sorry for saying pep talk. However, if you've got a demonstrated project with the milestones on it saying that how many days it's going to happen across and then what you're trying to improve and how it's going to be efficient in terms of the cost and the process. If not the cost, how is it turning around things quickly? Then believe you me, you give three examples and then your management will be convinced of doing. So it, it's all up to you, you know, uh, you, the way you present it and the way you take it across to your management. But what I suggest is keep knocking. You keep knocking and the door will open. Please don't be disheartened. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. So we'll take a last question here by Mrs. Mr. Adil Hanna. Uh, is innovation helping in achieving better compliances? Mr. Adil, good evening. I hope you're doing well. Thank you for the question. Yes, I, in one of the slides, I've explained the examples of the four different areas. That is in the banking, in the shipping, and the customs. Definitely innovation helps in achieving the compliance. And the opening slide itself, I think you missed the opening slide. We, we gave a very good example uh, about the conflict diamonds and smuggling and all. So with the innovation technology of the blockchain, you, you can see very clearly saying end-to-end -end transparency is available for everybody so that innovation is ensuring that the complete transaction is in compliant manner. Thank you. Uh, can we take one more question, Mr. Rao, or is uh, you? Sure, let's <laughs> get last question, please. Yeah. Uh, last question. See, Mr. Ishwar Padmanathan has a lot of questions, but uh, uh, we'll take his last question as uh, this question as a last. Will compliance and innovation drive value chain and be complementary? It is not uh, complementary, actually. 
in in the in the value chain as like value stream process of the supply chain supply chain itself has to be compliant and if it is not compliant then it, it's going to go haywire and definitely that's what we are saying compliance and innovation are integral part of it compliance is integral part of it innovation should take it to the next levels into it and definitely mr ishwar you are a, a, a very well learned person and i know uh, when you're asking these questions of course i, I could make out that this could be the practical problems what you're facing in our daily life and definitely yes it's how we present it how we address it and how we mold it into a packet when we go to the management and i totally agree with you they drive the value chain thank you whether you're on mute sir okay I think so. It's almost done. If you want to take one more question from Mr. Uh, Raul Elif, or it's uh, no. He has already given you the many thanks for the uh, presentation, Mr. Raul. When is the next session? Next session for everyone. It will be <laughs> hope so in the new year, and we are planning not online. It will be uh, one to one in, in uh, as as usual how our sessions are conducted in hotels or maybe some events will be there. But it is everything. We say in Arabic, you know, bad kasal alam. I say bad al kasal alam. So anything now, it's after the World Cup. So hope you guys have enjoyed this uh, session with the uh, innovative knowledge of Mr. Rao, and plus the question answer session also also good. I hope inshallah we can meet again with uh, everyone uh, physically, and we'll have more interactive session. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rao. It was uh, amazing to have you on the uh, this board, and it was really it was very helpful for the people from the supply chain management, not only procurement, contracts, logistics, and all these things. As you say, supply chain management is a whole cycle process wherein everything is there. And again, I thank each and every participant who participated actively, and they were there with us from time one at five o'clock to six twenty right now. So we hope to see you again, guys, and all the best, and keep. Uh, uh, sharing and we hope uh, this fifa world cup will bring more prosperity to the state of qatar and we say all the best for the participant for non participant for the volunteers for the residents of qatar and the rulers and the sponsorships of the qatar and thank you very much mr rao it was amazing thank you for qatar airways to bringing all 1.2 million people in qatar we hope so we will have a very good uh, fifa world cup thank you Thank you all, uh, Mr. Badar. Uh, thanks, Manoj, for being the co-panelist, and also would like to extend my thanks to QDB, our sponsor, and all the attendees. I hope you found it useful. In case you need to contact me, I've also given my uh, contact details. And many of you are connected to me either on the WhatsApp or on the LinkedIn. You're more than welcome to always get in touch with us, and we we are there to support you. And before ending, one last statement, which I always make it. please be updated or else you get outdated so it's essential that you you need to be on top of it so compliance with the innovation is the key for the survival of our procurement yeah thank you and have a great evening and i wish you good luck thank you very much mr rao see you guys good evening to every person so we can leave now <laughs>